Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, podcast. Welcome to the uh, financial engineering, the quant financial engineering podcast. Um, today, I have a special guest, uh, Joseph Furlong. Uh, I've known Joseph for uh, quite some time. We've never done a podcast together. Uh, but um, Joe has uh, ideas. He's got uh, some. He's got things to say, and and uh, today we'll uh, we'll talk about his um, his view on the two two year two 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 year to to ten year inversion, and 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 have a discussion around rates, and have a discussion around what's going on in the market, and uh, and inflation, and and maybe even the economy. So uh, to that end, uh, uh, Joe, welcome. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. So uh, tell us, what's this two two versus 10 inversion rate that you're talking? Well, it's, it's an interesting concept. So the better explain it is to kind of talk about the the, 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 the treasury yields in general. As you may be aware, you have different durations starting from one week to three weeks to three months, all the way up to 30 years. And typically... The yields associated with those um, treasuries or notes um, go up the longer the duration, because you would think the longer the duration, you would want to get more money, uh, more return. So typically, if you have a two-year uh, uh, duration, no, it would be you know, 2%, and then the 10-year would be more than 2%. That's typically, it slopes from left to right upwards. Uh, but a, a, a few times in history, it actually what's called inverts, which means that you actually get a higher rate for a shorter duration compared to a longer duration. And that creates a very unique situation because why would you invest your money in a 10-year time frame at a lower rate than when you can have it for either six months or a year or even two years? Because obviously the longer your money is outstanding, the more volatility can a, in, exist. And you never know what's going to happen in the future. So I'd rather lock in my 5% rate for six months than lock in 4% for 10 years. It's just a very unusual paradigm. And historically, now, this is not a guarantee because nothing in financial forecasting is ever a guarantee. There's never a, a direct 100% causational but typically what happens is when those invert like that, uh, it is a sign of a future recession. Now, what is unique over the last couple of years, because we've been in the 10 slash two year inversion period for a very long time. I, I think looking at it, probably look at a 2022. So multiple years we've been looking at this inversion and yet a lot of times you could think, well, we really haven't been in a recession during that time. So, and it's now just recently started to get become equal. So the ten-year T bill and the te and the two-year T bill are basically the same. Now that it changes every day. Clearly, I think even as of this morning, the te the ten years at three eighty-eight and the two years at four thirty-eight. So it kind of diverged a little bit. Uh, but ultimately, it's still inverted, but it's getting very close of not being inverted anymore. But yet we haven't hit a recession. And that's a big question, because generally, this is a pretty good indicator of why uh, when we go into recession. Now, if you go back to the COVID errors, there was a short period of time where we were in technical recession, where we had two down GDPs of quarters in a row. But we really have that since then over the last couple of years. And every day when I look at these numbers, because ultimately part of my job of be working in the uh, risk analytics in the banking and finance industry, which I've been doing for 35 years now, is, is keeping an eye on, on the rates and see exactly how it impacts what mortgage rates are going to do and ultimately affects how they're going to prepay or maybe default. It, there's a lot of factors that go into these that go into the understanding the behavior of loans, frankly. And, and I'm looking at this, and it definitely has the the it has some impacts of the economy, but I it's just been seen, it's been so skewed recently, I had to step back and say, okay, what else is involved here? 
And when I, I was recently looking at it when it inverted, maybe about a week or so, where it came very close of uninverting, I was thinking, okay, this was right when the Fed came out and they decided not to lower the rates, but yet the 10-year the T-bill rate dropped. So comment is, well, if the Fed's not going to lower the rates, the market's going to do it. Now, now they're stating that in September of 2024, that's when the next 25 basis points with the Fed's going to come out. Well, some people even saying more. Some people actually saying up to 150 basis points. Now, I don't think that is the case. If that is the case, that is uh, a very, very bad sign for economy if we have to reduce at 150 basis points where the Fed has to reduce 150 basis points. But ultimately, um, although the inversion is not the end all be all to everything, it is just an one of many metrics that you can look at to see exactly what's going on. And and frankly, the last couple of years has been bizarre. And maybe it's because getting out of COVID, because we've definitely had distortions because of COVID. Uh, there may be other market forces. There may be geopolitical forces. There's just a lot going into it. But, but ultimately, it's interesting to me on how when the Fed comes out and says they're not going to reduce it, the market does it anyway. Okay, um, so let's let's open this up a little bit and get into the week. Sure. So, um, all right. So the so the two year is is here and the ten year is there. Now, when we say the the rate, I mean the rate is essentially a function because it's not a rate that is set, right? It's a function of what's going on in the of of the of of the bonds being traded. So for the yield to go up, it means that the price of the bond is going down. And if the price of the bond is going down, that means that there are more sellers than buyers. So nobody wants to hold the short maturity bond. Well, actually, I prefer holding the short duration bond because there's less volatility. Because even if you buy it at par and the rates go up in the marketplace and your value goes down, you're going to get back at par in six months. But when you have a 10 year, you're buying at a par at four and the rates go up, your, your value is going to go down. And that was one of the main reasons of the recent banking collapse in March of last year, when these banks failed, uh, Silicon Valley, Signature, et cetera, is because they needed the liquidity. They put, they put their excess capital into Treasury is thinking it's a guaranteed return and their their capital is is safe, except for when they had a liquidity crunch, when the deposits got pulled out of it, they needed to sell the bonds at a significant discount, or in essence, they had to mark their market, their bonds to, to market, which then all of a sudden their capital was er eroded because the rates went against them and their bonds greatly detracted in value. So that's why. Generally, when you look at the longer term durations, it um, has that risk into it. Um, and, and I think in those cases, now granted, I wasn't involved in any of those banks. I don't know the specifics, but I, I surmise that they didn't proper what I call ladder the bonds, where they bought some very short, medium and long term. So they could, if they needed to have some liquidity, they can sell the, the shorter term stuff where it wouldn't have be so impacted by the rates compared to the longer term. But I don't know. But uh, in my opinion and what I've been told and read in the papers, that was a major impact of, of those banking failures and just one example. But even recently, what is also even more perplexing to me is every week, every month, they come out, the government issues these these bond auctions because they need to to, to fund the government because of the def uh, deficit, uh, deficit that we're running. And what is occurring that these auctions are undersubscribed, meaning they do not have enough people to buy them. So there's a lot of different ways that they can get to do that. Sometimes they can force the major broker dealers to buy them. Sometimes they have to pay more on uh, the initial rates so people would be more incentivized to buy them at par. But again, then the market gets triggered by whatever economic indicators that are coming out or geopolitical factors that are coming out and the rates adjust in real time every single day. Uh, and it's just a, a very interesting market to watch and it has 
such far reaching impacts on not only what our day to day lives are, but what possibly happen in the future. Uh, and this, what is I'm sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. No. One of the things that is is always challenging is when the Fed who actually well the Treasury Department issues the auctions, but when the Fed seems their public announcements seem to be different than what the market is doing and what the Treasury Department is actually executing on, it makes you wonder what really is going on there. It's very unique and confusing to me. First, I will say that you're correct. The $25 billion last week, the dealers had to step in and they had to pay up to, to clear it. And then I look historically, you know, that, that since 2022, they are having issues. In the past, it was okay, but since 2020, I mean, they're able to, to I mean, and, and we should tell everyone exactly that, you know, why, why do we care? Well, because we need to refinance this debt. I think because this year it's, is it a two, do we have a deficit, uh, I think it's a, a trillion or two trillion that they have to issue or? Yes, it's it's a, tr they were, our deficit's a trillion dollars every hundred days. Of things. Imagine, so they got to go out because we don't have the cash anymore. We got to refinance it. So you got to go to the market. You got to get the money at some point, And this is a, probably a discussion for a, a later podcast. At some point, they're going to say no. And then, you know, then we have a, a, a real issue because uh, you 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 can't pay your debt. And but to your point though, I, I I feel that people are not. I mean, at least the public at large is really focusing on the equity market because they understand it. It's exciting. You know, you have it every day. The stocks go up, down. But when it comes to the credit markets, it's the rates, it's risk, and I and that's and that's something that I always bring up in my in my class is that the market is not really fair. They do talk about the returns, you know, mutual funds and NVIDIA. Look, they made 2,500% in, in two months or whatever. But when it comes to risk and rates, well, you don't see, you know, you don't see too many people talking about it even in, in, in the, um, on the networks and the media because it's a, it's a difficult concept. It's risk. It's uh, what do you mean we're not going to refinance? What do you mean the rates is higher? What drives the rates? What do they make? They don't make anything. It's rates. And who's, well, um, NVIDIA, oh yeah, I understand what it is. The stock is moving up and down. So so this, and you're right. No one is really talking. I mean, they I hear it mentioned once in a while, oh, we have inverted yield, therefore it means recession. And and now I'm hearing a little bit. There was a last week, I think, one reporter talked about the fact that this 25 billion didn't go as well. And then we went back into is the Fed gonna lower the rates? Um unemployment, uh the the the, uh, the trade rotation. Are we gonna rotate in small cars? Versus, so, but there's mm -hmm. no discussion really around this important topic that you're bringing up. I, I, I have some thoughts on that. And, and the my, the initial one that I have is, and just speaking, frankly, talking about bonds is boring. It's not sexy at all. Um, it, it doesn't have the zing as talking about the stocks, or the option markets and doing all this stuff. Um, that's the first thing. Um, so obviously the, the most of the talking points out there and the shows are talking about equities and options because that draws people in the, in the conversation. Uh, and understandably so. And unless you're in an industry that demands following the bond market, you typically kind of ignore it. But my, in my opinion, the bond market is, is equally as important and in some cases as at least exciting, if not more exciting than the equity market, because it really has the tentacles that touch so much of our world. It touches our everyday mortgage rates. You hear, is mortgage rates going up or down? Well, just follow the 10-year T-bill. That will tell you whether interest rates are going up or down in the mortgage rate. Um, it deals with liquidity. It deals with um, our ec economy. It deals with our ability to um, you know, have the strength of the dollar. It looks at our money supply. It, it deals with everything. It's so interconnected. Um, and also because of that, it, there's so many tentacles. No one can know and follow everything. It's very complex. Uh, Lord knows every day I learn something new and I look back at what I said before and I'm saying, well, that was pretty stupid to say. Uh, but ultimately, um, I watch it because one, I think it's it's an important part of my daily life and what I, what I have to do. But 
frankly, I, I find it fun because it, it really has impacts other things that are important to me, not only professionally, but personally. Yes. And it is not made easy. A job to is not made easy because they really, um, you know, because it's, it's, everything is focused on what I guess people can understand. Uh, and I always said, you know, all right. So at the end of the day, if you, you know, because obviously, uh, you know, everyone wants to make money in the stock market. So they, there's always this idea that that the price risk of the market, the price risk is tied to the credit risk because they always tied, you know, the idea that a stock goes up and down or because uh, if the economy makes money or not. But I always said that but the, 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 the most successful investor of all time, which I believe is Jim Simmons, was a mathematician. It was about risk. And somehow they have a tendency to disconnect I mean, definitely. I mean, they don't even really talk about rates. But even when it comes to the stock market, they're, dis they're disconnecting it to what what else might be really happening and driving. So to get information, unless they get to podcasts like such as this one or your posts, you know, um, uh, the, the, the 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 public is not well served, I believe. And and this is why then you know you come in on Monday morning, and the stock. The market is down thousand points. So what happened? And then if you oh well, this is a, it, it's always like a big surprise. Like this this national debt, this rate, this recession everybody keeps expecting for the past two years, and it's still not coming. But yet they're not focusing on hey, we may not be because we not be be able to refinance this debt. What what happens if 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 they can't do it? That that's we really we have a few we only have a few choices. The the best choice is we need to grow the economy out of it. it will be the first thing. So the ultimately the GDP gets to the point where our our level of of debt is below it. Right now I think we're at one hundred and eighteen percent of GDP, which is just an obscene level. Um, it's meaning that our GDP output on an annual basis is less than our total debt. That is a very, very bad situation to be. So we need to be that to be down 70, 80 percent. So we need to grow the economy to do that. That would be the ideal solution. Uh, the, the other one is if we uh, we need to be able to curtail our spending and, and, and be more fiscally responsible. And that's I don't think that's ever going to happen, regardless of what administration goes into it. It just seems like every government wants to do is spend and spend and spend. Now, sometimes they're legitimate. Sometimes they're not. Um, the, the third one is defaulting. Well, that can't happen uh, because if we actually do have to default, that has such economic consequences because the U.S. dollar will no longer be the reserve currency. We will not have any liquidity. All those things that you can possibly imagine times 10 would occur. So realistically, the only reasonable path that needs to be done is we need to have policies in place to be able to grow. But that takes effort and 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 forethought, uh, and and then at the same time we need to be able to control our expenses. And I, I think everything in my life has been not only understanding the risk, but I say quantifying the risk, trying to figure out how to mitigate it. You'll never eliminate it, but you need to be able to control for it and plan for it. And that is such a difficult topic to do. It's a, such a very very difficult process. Um, and every circumstance deem is is requires different strategies. But in this one, we need to get our fiscal house in order. We need to be able to put in policies where we grow the country, manage our debt, and then hopefully the rest will start to be get better over a year. This will not change overnight. Well, I think uh, folks should remember what happened in Greece. I mean, they were in the same situation. And uh, in that case, Greece, uh, you know, overborrowed. And what did they do? They forced them to raise their taxes. They they extended the uh, retirement age, and they lowered the payout. I mean, it was, and they, of course, they went into a recession. Uh, so you figure, well, Greece. I mean, you know, this is Greece. It's a small country. Well, right now in Europe, France is having some real issues. Uh, Europe as a whole is 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 also overburdened with debt. So. And then to to your point, I think there's a bigger concept that right now we we're thinking, you know, we're thinking about the equity market and 
and and but but no one is really paying attention to government borrowings at some point right and of course the, the beast feeds itself because you know how could you be elected and say okay you know what i'm going to raise your taxes i'm going to cut your entitlement i'm going to extend your the maturity of your i'm going to extend your um retirement age i mean france tried to do that they were in the streets for three to four weeks breaking everything because they say i don't want to retire at 68 and you're nuts i want to retire at 60 and so what do you think is is going to happen here at some point well, I, I think ultimately um, we're going to follow into the same thing we've been doing for decades is uh, is put our head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist and kick it down the, the, the can down the road. But to your point, it's right. It's going to come home to roost. Uh, the question is, when will it actually hit that that marker? It's just like you, having your family budget. You cannot spend 120 percent of your annual income every single year and expect to be successful. You just, you just can't do that over the long term. So I, I'm, because every, if everything you just described about the retirement, the, the increased taxes, the austerity, all that stuff will 100% come into play if we do not take it into, into consideration. The only difference between the United States and Greece is just the ec economies of scale. Because we have so large, we have such a big economy, we could probably kick it down the, 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 the road a little further and not have those consequences. But if changes aren't made sooner or later, it's going to rear its ugly head. And I hope, being, I'm hoping over the, the next decade or two that we can come up with a reasonable solution that, uh, like I said, has good growth within the economy. We can keep our spending in check. We can start managing our debt will never be zero debt i can't imagine that ever being case. well not in my lifetime i will never have zero debt but ultimately having a trillion dollar deficit every 100 days is not sustainable it just we need to control that it is and not well we do, I mean, it, it is not sustainable Let, let's keep in mind one thing is that uh, we have about nine years left before we run out of money for social security so there's a there's a kind of a deadline what i find interesting is that the market is not the market is not focusing on it, and and people should start thinking. Investors should should start to prepare their portfolio accordingly, because if you're gonna you're about to need the money in ten years, and you just let it ride like nothing is happening, you could be a very nasty surprise. In uh, is I don't know. Whenever the market decide this is an issue, I mean we don't talk about it. I don't think even the candidates really talk about it that much. It's about topics that frankly easily understood. Third uh, rail. But, it's a third rail in politics. You can't talk about it. No, they no exactly. So at some point, the market is going to say, you know what? I think we have a problem, and I think we're not going to be able to refinance. And then it's going to obviously impact the market. The question is, you know, when do we decide to make a a, a big deal out of it? Is uh, is a question mark. I, I the only I, only way that's going to change because you're right. The politicians won't talk about it uh, because even hinting about it. The, uh, it is it's a kiss of death on their political uh, uh, campaign. It is the third rail. No one wants to touch it. And ultimately, um, it, it really requires markets uh, sentiment. People need to understand that this can't continue um, and or it will have significant changes. And I don't see American populace changing their approach to it. Um, just like you said on Greece, they don't I want to retire at 60. I don't want to retire at 68. And I understand that point of view that you pay, they paid in Social Security their entire lives. They're ready to retire. They don't want to be kicked in the face. Um, it is a very, very difficult scenario. And I, and it's it, I, I wish there's a solution. I think the easiest one is to put in policy procedures so we can have actually good American growth, grow our GDP, manage spending. And then over time that it can we can work our way out of it. Uh, but I mean. I don't know. It's it's just really difficult, and I I wish we could have a conversation about it politically, but it seems like it's impossible to have right now. No, unless the market starts uh, uh, forcing to them. Okay, so this is an interesting discussion. Maybe we should come back to see what happens later on to see if uh, there's issue with the next re uh, um, auction and 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 uh, especially after the election or maybe during the election if anybody brings it up or if they are if the market continues to behave the way it is. Uh, mostly focus on uh, you know simpler topics and uh, so um, I want to thank you for uh, giving your thought there Joe that was very helpful my my pleasure I'm always welcome to come back anytime you wish well, of course
Thank you very much. Thank you.